So is the AI innovation of the world right now only happening in LLMs or is it happening across the entire full stack all the way down to the foundational hardware? Uh, welcome to this AI Insights with John Rose. I have my friend Mark Papermaster, the CTO of AMD and uh, you know, long, long uh, co-journey co person on this AI journey. We just spoke recently and I thought it'd be great to have a conversation about a number of things, but given Mark's expertise and background and things we're doing together, I thought we'd start with, uh, hey, let's talk about compute and processing and, and what's happening there. And so maybe to, well, first welcome, Mark. Uh, great to have you here. John, thanks for having me on your podcast. Okay, great. Well, let's let's jump into, you know, maybe the first framing question, given your background and things we do together is, is you know, the compute world in AI is not monolithic. There's actually you know, at least two very different computing ecosystems that have to innovate at, at speed for this to work. One is the training environment of the world, yes. and the other is what we call inferencing. But, but you know, as we move into agentic, it is more and more tied to where agents are going to run and, and you know, and how distributed AI is going to happen. And so these, these two worlds look similar. They maybe use the same microarchitecture and the same componentry, but they are not the same industry. So Mark, you know, given your, your expertise background and what you're seeing, how should people think about first the delineation between them and then second kind of how you're seeing the innovation cycles happen? You know, it's a, it's a great starting for, point for the chat. I mean, uh, AI really is moving us in the field of computing at faster rates than we ever have before. Our rollout of new silicon devices is speeding up. AI is actually helping us speed up uh, the frequency at which we can get new chips to market. But it's more than that. We, of course, continue to uh, innovate at the silicon level, John, but now think about uh, the innovations in the algorithm that are tied into the silicon. You have different math approximations. You know, are you running uh, are you running uh, with a floating point 16 was always the predominant math way in uh, format in which people coded, but there's different uh, uh, and lower precision uh, math that, that can be actually baked in the hardware to accelerate more and more AI performance at less power, less cost. Uh, and, and so it's, it's all about the innovation cycle uh, in silicon being paired with the innovation cycle in the actual algorithms and, and application deployments. And you, you said, hey, Mark, you know, what about training versus uh, inference and the, the plethora of inference applications? You bet uh, on us as a silicon provider at AMD and certainly for Dell, uh, you know, that is causing us to be very thoughtful on how we service the different AI applications. So uh, for us at AMD, uh, we have big CPU and GPU com uh, combinations. When I say big, I mean super high performance, uh, built-in uh, scalability to scale nodes up vertically, meaning the pod size of your, you know, your basic uni unit of building out massive uh, AI clusters uh, is going up, and then the size of the clusters is going up. And what's driving that? Training large language models that are you know, really going to trillion parameter models and, and beyond uh, because uh, we are indeed seeing yet more and more LLM capability that they can do in more accuracy when you get more and more massive models. But that doesn't translate to inferencing. So when, when, when you want to run inferencing, uh, you, you, there are optimizations that we can do both for the LLMs, but also you're seeing more and more finely tuned models and small language models, SLMs. And for that, I, I think yet again, what we're all seeing is uh, tuning both the silicon uh, and, uh, and the algorithms to, to take advantage of that. And so, you know, that's why for us, uh, it's just not one size fits all. We've put AI acceleration across our entire portfolio of data center, of, uh, of edge, uh, of PC devices and embedded devices. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the, the noise in the industry in terms of excitement is around these big L11 racks and these gigantic, you know, AI clusters, which by the way, we love, but mutually we all think that's a great market. It's fantastic. These customers are incredibly demanding. They're doing the amount of innovation is exciting, but you know, you can measure in a fairly small number, the number of people who build those there, there, there aren't that many of them and there don't need to be a lot of them. Uh, but they're very foundational. What comes out of them is the innovation that flows into the enterprise, the models that we all use. So we should all pay attention to it. 
But when you flip to that other side, the inference world, that touches yeah. everybody. That's that is the foundation of agentic. That is the ability to put. You know, we use this phrase: bring the AI to the data. Well, mm -hmm. if the, in order to do that, you have to build a data center where the data is. That seems like a very heavy lift. But if, on the other hand, you can miniaturize AI, you can deliver an agent on a small form factor, you can embed it. That becomes extremely interesting. And you guys have kind of a unique, uh, you know, capability set in the sense that you're. It's not just about GPUs when we talk about inferencing. There's there are many ways to process AI in the world, and you know, maybe what's your what's your take on on kind of how that's evolving and how people are thinking about what kind of processing element should I use when I'm dealing with a, an inference or a, an agentic environment? Well, what you said is, I think, very nascent in the industry, where where uh, people are looking at the cost of AI as suddenly their uh, entire business starts to adopt it. And when everybody starts running AI, uh, it, it gets very expensive very quickly. And so what we're seeing actually is really most businesses I talk to, John, I love your thoughts if you're hearing the same thing, but most businesses I, I talk to are uh, finely tuning models to the problem that they are trying to optimize around. Uh, it could be generative AI, but generative AI for a specific, their business, and, they, and they're loading on uh, in their own private model all of the, the data they need to make that effective. And likewise, right to the uh, factory floor, tailored uh, embedded, uh, embedded AI devices with small language models finely tuned for that task on a factory floor. Uh, and so I, I think we're at the very beginning of that kind of tailoring. And what's exciting to me, you and I both talked to, to startups, uh, what I love is you can really get a gauge of what's come to coming next by looking where are the startups focusing. There's some really exciting startups uh, who are making it much easier to, to run significant AI inferencing on PC class devices. And what, what uh, we've done, because we play in the cloud all the way through uh, PC and the edge, we've created one software stack, one set of optimizations. It's the same uh, you know, GPU and, and, and CPU architecture uh, across that plethora. So we're hard at work making it as seamless as possible, whether you're running cloud, edge, or PC. Yeah, I think you're, you know, it's interesting while the processing elements, obviously having a, a range of different processing options and form factors and power envelopes is critical. The, the hardware doesn't just work. It needs an interface. The interface is software. And I think we've seen significant, you know, expansion of the software ecosystem. But to your point, you know, if you're a developer and you want to build an agent, you want it to run, you kind of like it to be able to work across platforms and across, you know, topologies. And the idea that, you know, any of these systems are going to be monolithic and isolated doesn't make any sense anymore. These are hybrid connected systems. That's and right. so as much consistency as we can give to the run times and the, the APIs associated with it, the better. And, uh, again, I think, you know, maybe what, what's your, uh, what's your view on the, the, the maturity of those technologies? Cause I think we've been on this journey for a while, but I think you're, you know, you're now, you know, the, the users of your, not just your hardware, but your software are evolving and, and how, how are we at from a maturity perspective versus a few years ago? Yeah, it, it's a great question, John, because uh, we clearly, we got competitive hardware out with our first launch of, uh, uh, from our MI300 GPU uh, stood tall in terms of its competitive capabilities, particularly inference where you had an advantage of the high bandwidth uh, memory around the GPU compute cores. Uh, and so what we've set is a very ag aggressive journey for the software enablement. We've been at it for years and it got battle hardened. We launched December, 2023. So 2024 was the, the first, I'll say production rollout of our uh, competitive GPU. And we focused with the biggest hyperscalers because they were the most demanding customers, uh, deep experts in applying AI. And trust me, they battle tested us. And they said, therefore our software stack got battle tested and, uh, and hardened. And so what we did as 2025 rolled around, it, it, we took that battle hardened uh, software stack and we said, now we've got to get that out to the community. We're open source. Uh, we want to bring the community with us. That that's, uh, how we want to uh, differentiate uh, versus our, our uh, GPU competitor. Uh, and so what we did in 2025 is we really opened up 
uh, the, the, for the development community to make it easy. We created uh, access to where they can run software, continuous integration and, and uh, con continuous development and continuous integration so they could easily develop on our software stack and promote code. Uh, we worked with uh, open source repositories like Hugging Face uh, making sure that uh, that open source models run well on AMD and that every night they could be tested to make sure they still run uh, well on AMD. Uh, and then we announced at our advancing uh, AI event uh, a few months ago, uh, opening up a developer cloud. So we now uh, have you know hundreds of thousands of users that uh, that we can get time slices and and develop right on that cloud and and promote uh, the code which they have optimized on AMD. So it's been an extremely concerted effort, first to make sure that the software stock was uh, rock hard, and then over the course of 2025, really opening up uh, to our developer ecosystem. It's amazing, you know, we forget, uh, you're, you're, you're having to think about the date, uh, December 2023. I mean, that is not that far ago. And yet That's it right. seems like it was years ago. This thing is moving so fast. I remember when you launched it and you know, it was like, great, now we, we have a, a, an option out there. It looks like a good chip. Let's see how it goes. And, and we're less than like a year and a half later. And it seems like it was ages ago. The, the industry has just moved on. Uh, you know, and the innovation cycles are moving pretty fast. Maybe the last topic is, like we care a lot about activating the enterprise. I think the yes. foundation models are going well. I think the large scale training environments are going well. I think the public AI services and the consumer world are, are moving along nicely. The real value though is the enterprise because this is the single most important tool to improve the productivity of the world. And if it isn't applied to our industrial base, our medical mm -hmm. institutions, our educational institutions, it don't mean anything. And the good news is we're seeing progress. We have about 3,000 customers running AI factories today and growing very fast. Um, I'd love your thoughts on just, you know, if both even experience within the AMD or, or within the enterprise base, how you see it progressing, what, where you see the, you know, the activity, the good, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly about it. But, you know, any observations around, around how enterprise is progressing? Well, there's, there's a wide range of how enterprises are progressing. I, you know, there's a MIT study that, that said about 5% of enterprise are, are seeing, them, that seeing themselves already on the positive side of their investment, meaning the dollars they put in, they feel they're getting back that and more on the resulting productivity. Uh, and that's just indicative of where we are in the journey. We're early on the journey. Uh, and what, uh, what I'm hearing from customers is, uh, they're figuring out where to run their AI, wor AI workloads. They've all started with like chatbots and help desks and things like that. Some are still in that phase. Others have moved on uh, and have really built, uh, like we talked about earlier, more finely tuned models for their businesses and are addressing uh, their proprietary data. They're either working on the cloud and where it protects their proprietary models and weights and, and data, or they're running on-prem where, where they can safe chase uh, the protection of that of that data. Uh, and then what I'm, what I'm hearing from them is uh, they're all running hybrid, John. They're all running a mix of on-prem, some in the cloud, in, anywhere from 50-50 to 30-70, 70-30. I mean, it, uh, but they're all, they're all somewhere in that range. So, so everyone's early, everyone's uh, testing. Some have already gotten extensive deployments and are, and are quite productive. But what I'm looking for, uh, you know, is facilitating us beyond the, the start of the curve right now of adoption. It, we know, it's, it's very clear that, uh, of where this is gonna go. There's gonna be a, a highly accelerated adoption. So we view it as an as a onus on us and, and working with deep partners like, uh, like Dell. Uh, how do we make this easier? And so it goes back right to what we said earlier. How do we make it seamless for customers to uh, develop on a PC? That's an inexpensive uh, development platform take the resulting AI inferencing or agentic process uh, that, that you developed inexpensively and then deploy it. Uh, deploy it, a lot, most of them will probably go on-prem, but, it, but it'll always be some type of hybrid. And I think there's so much that we can do to facilitate that. You know, we are, we are seeing uh, where uh, people are shocked at what they can run on an AI PC. You can run a Llama 3.1, 70 billion parameter model uh, and, and of course it's air gap from a security standpoint because it's got, if it's a business running it, your IT is controlling the security of what comes in and out of, of that laptop. So I, I think it's very exciting times ahead for, uh, for enterprise deployment. And, 
And uh, I, I think boards and CEOs are looking at how to measure that because at this point, I think everyone agrees that uh, either you accelerate adoption of AI to make your employees more productive, or you have a very high risk of being left behind. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely correct. By the way, I mean, that MIT study and a bunch of other ones, you know, maybe people read it as doom and gloom. And there was some doom and gloom in there in the sense that, yeah, I acknowledge we're early and a whole bunch of people haven't gotten into production. There's work to be done. I, I, when you read it in detail, it basically says something else. It says, if you focus, if you know what problem you're solving, if you use the right tech stack, if you leverage the industry, you can get into production, you can get onto the other side. And when you do, it's a big deal. I mean, and we've seen examples out in the edge in the AI world of, you know, advanced thoracic surgery and yes. AI driven, you know, videos, you know, image processing or transformation of the entertainment experience. Or, I mean, it's just amazing what, you know, that, that front wave of AI is actually doing. And more and more of those things are happening out at the edge. They're happening in the real world. And so I think, uh, you know, we have a lot to do together. Uh, you know, computers everywhere, AI is yes. on top of that, and it's going to be exciting. So, Mark, Mark, thanks for joining me today. Uh, you know, great, great insights. Uh, looking forward to, you know, what's going to happen for the rest of this year and into next year. John, it's going to be an exciting future. And as always, I love chatting with you. It's always a, a mile a minute. And uh, we, uh, I think we share, both of us, a very strong optimism of what's to come eternal optimism. Right? We are tech optimists. That's a good term these days. So thank you, Mark. Great, great seeing you. Thanks everybody for joining.